and I kept going, wait, what? Wait, what? And then the end was like, like my pea brain exploded a little. So I hope you enjoy this. I also hope you like our new setting. Um, it may or may not move a little. I hope that's not too distracting, but there is a air vent right behind me and it's just gonna move right now. Um, I'm working on it. Test run. Anyway, tonight we are going to talk about Sharon Kinney, the serial killer. 
witnesses that were there. So, police questioned them further, and James's family confirmed that he was a gun lover, enthusiast, and he often left his guns around where the children could reach them. We're not going to talk about gun safety. Y'all know that you shouldn't do that, but Dana was found to be able to handle a gun, and when she was given a gun by the police, she played around with the safety, managed to turn it off, and the belief that it was plausible that she could have shot her father was then proven when she was able to pull the trigger. There were no fingerprints on the gun when they performed ballistics, but it was heavily oiled and the police did not test Sharon or Dana for gunshot residue. So, um, James is now deceased and Sharon collected $25,000 for his life insurance policy. And with this, she got the new car that she wanted, a Thunderbird. They're beautiful cars, but... In April of 1960, just a month after James's death, she upgraded her car at the urging of a salesman, a man named Walter Jones. Sharon took a liking to Mr. Jones, and they started to have an affair. A month later, she was pregnant, and she demanded that Walter marry her. There was just one hitch with that. Walter was already married, and he did not want to leave his wife for Sharon. And, as Sharon's luck would have it, oh, Walter's wife goes missing two days later. Her name was Patricia. When Patricia did not come home from work, James started to speak with her friends, and he filed a missing persons report, and he started to uncover some clues to the whereabouts of his missing wife. One group who carpooled to work with Patricia had quite an intriguing story to tell Walter. They informed him that Patricia had received a mysterious phone call at work, and the caller was a female, and wished to speak with her after work. Patricia agreed to this meeting and asked her carpool driver to drop her off at the meetup spot in Independence. They confirmed that a woman was waiting there for Patricia. A woman that matched Sharon's description. So, believably, the last person to see Patricia alive was a woman who looked a lot like Sharon. And Sharon admitted it. She said that she met with Patricia to tell Patricia all about the affair that her husband was having with Patricia's sister. No, sorry, with Sharon's sister, who obviously did not exist. And then she dropped Patricia off at home. Walter didn't believe a word of this. Smart man. And he actually... Okay, I retract my smart man comment, pulled a knife on Sharon, and said, You're gonna tell me where Patricia is. Sharon, of course, denied knowing anything, and volunteered to help in the search for Patricia. She, in fact, 
Sharon's story is far from over. In March of 1963, this murder conviction was overturned on the basis that Sharon's ways deemed inadequate. That the challenges came up during jury selection and everyone knew of the case. So they overturned it. She won an appeal. And in fact, they let her out on bail, which to me is absolutely crazy. So they ordered a new trial and they let this lady out on bail. I can't believe they overturned it because they thought that something happened with the jury. Like, that's crazy to me that they, I, you know, a couple of, well, a year later overturned it. That doesn't happen. Like, how many times has Adnan Sayed asked for a retrial? Three, four, cr anyway. All right. So, in March of 1964, Sharon goes on trial again for her husband's murder. But it ended in a mistrial after only a few days when it was discovered that one of the jurors had been represented by a previous law partner of the prosecutor, which I don't really understand why that affected the case, but in the summer of 1964, the third trial began, and Sharon's former lover, John, the one who discovered the body, remember, he testified that Sharon had offered him $1,000 to kill James Kinney, her husband. His story was flimsy, and he later said that Sharon just may have been joking when she said this. Sharon's prison lover, a woman named Margaret Hopkins, testified that Sharon had confessed to the murders of both James and Patricia to her. And Sharon decides she's got to take the stand to defend herself, so she takes the stand for the first time in three trials. Um, well, four, technically. Um, <laughs> and she said that they were both liars. She again blamed James's death on the two-year-old, Dana. She said, Dana comes out into the bathroom trying to get me to play with her. She made several trips to the bedroom trying to get attention from James. She brought in several toys and asked him questions. And then I heard her in the bedroom and she was saying, show me this, daddy, show me this. Just as she had done several times before with her toys and... All of a sudden, I heard something. I guess it was a shot. How do you not know this? I ran into the bedroom, and Dana was standing there, and James was lying there, and I saw the blood, and I thought he was dead. I picked Dana up, and I put her on the couch, and I called James's father. Why did she call his father and not 911? The jury deadlocked seven to five in the favor of acquittal. As the jurors could not agree on a verdict, another trial was set for October of 1964. Sharon was free for now, and she spent much of her time hanging around in the bad part of town where the mafia was in charge. She eventually shacked up with a small-time thief and con artist named Samuel Bougalese. The two decided that they were going to run away to Mexico.
Patricia Jones, but uh, Sharon could not be retried for this crime because there's this tiny thing called double jeopardy. Sharon sits in jail until the summer of 1965. She was sentenced to 10 years in Mexican prison for Francisco's murder. Police believe she planned it, with robbery being the motive. She would later, of course, try to appeal this and ended up with an additional three years tacked on to her sentence, which I think is hilarious, but Sharon was known to rule over the prison and she was known as, uh, I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but La Pistolera, or the gunfighter on the inside. She had her own store in the prison, and she took immense pride in the fact that her fellow inmates were quite terrified of her. In December of 1969, so she's been in jail for like five years at this point, there's a power outage at the women's prison where Sharon was incarcerated. And you guys, she escaped. Guards noticed that she was missing about 9 p.m. that night, but they did not inform senior authorities until 2 a.m. Police arrived at the prison perimeter and noticed footprints and a fire escape ladder set near the 8-foot high fence. A massive manhunt started. Sharon has never been seen since. And in fact, the Mexican authorities gave up looking for her by the end of December. Theories on Sharon's disappearance are that she made a friend in prison, possibly a guard, and escaped over that wall into freedom. Her mother had called her that day, and it is believed that she was involved in the escape. Another rumor is that the family of her victim, Francisco, helped her escape and then murdered her some kind of payback. Some people believe that she escaped over the Guatemalan border. A large search went for Sharon, but and they never found her. They included transport hubs. The police looked everywhere. But like I said, by the end of the month, they'd given up. The authorities admitted they had completely run out of leads. And now, 50 years later, she is still missing. Sharon Kenny has the longest current outstanding arrest warrant for murder in the history of Kansas City, Missouri, and one of the longest outstanding felony warrants in American history. Guys, I could not believe this case. Like, the more I read and the more I researched, the more I was like, wait a minute, what is happening? So let's start at the beginning. She didn't have everything that she wanted, and her husband wasn't going to give it to her. And despite the fact that he admitted he was finally going to give her a divorce, she was like, nope, I'm going to get his life insurance policy. And she kills him. Let's face it, the two-year-old whether or not she could pull the trigger or not, that she did not shoot James. Um, I, I find that kind of odd. It was the back of his head, and she was running in and out of the room asking him to play with her, and brought him several toys, so to me there was no way that he was still sleeping, and she caught him in the back of the head. He was probably looking at the little girl um, if she was in the room with him. That's just my theory. Patricia is an easy one. She gets pregnant by this Walter guy. She's known him for like the whole of a minute. And she's like, oh, well, 
frisky with him, he probably would have passed out after, so you probably could have just robbed him and left. Um, what do I know? Uh, she must have been crafty. I gotta say, she convinced a lot of people to do what she wanted, and she was very promiscuous for the 1960s. That wasn't a very common thing back then. Um, prison lover, you know, I, you learn how to survive in prison, I guess, so, yeah. And then to go to Mexican prison, and then escape. Like, how many people have you heard actually escape from jail and then are never found ever again? That completely baffled me that she just had a fire escape ladder, propped it up on the wall, and made a run for it during a power outage. Like, she saw her opportunity, seized it, and was like, yo, I'm out. Uh, that's probably not what she said in, you know, 1965, but, uh, absolutely crazy for me. I assume that she did not come back to the United States. Um, I couldn't find anything about who has her children. Um, I don't know if her mother had them or did James's family have them. I don't know what happened to her three children. I am curious to know where the tiny boy was when supposedly her sister shot her dad, but, uh, Anyway, I thought you guys could use a break from uh, missing persons cases and enjoy a little uh, serial killer story. Uh, really, she only killed three people, so I don't know if that... I think it's three that makes you a serial killer. Anyway, I really thought this case had some twists and turns, and I'd never heard it before. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I would love to know what you think in the comments down below. I am so glad you guys enjoyed Sean and I's tomato video. It was quite fun to film. I actually almost didn't do it because I thought you guys would think it was stupid. Um, I had everything set up and I was like, no, this is dumb. Why am I doing this? But you guys really seem to like Sean. So I am trying to make him not make him. I'm trying to have him make some extra content for my channel. Just stuff you guys could listen to. Um, extra types of content. But you seem to like his whisper, so maybe he could do some true crime too. I don't know. I'd love to know what you thought in the comments down below. Anyway, I am going to get off of here and go do some stuff that needs to be done. I don't like adulting. I want to go back to being 16. Anyway, my mom got a new car this weekend. Um, you'll hear all about that story later on this week when I post my ramble video that Sean and I filmed, but I will see you guys soon before I keep spoiling everything. <laughs>